Our next speaker from the Toronto Centre, Mr. Peter Brethren, is going to talk about um, early days of astronomy in Kingston. And from this moment on, your moderator until the end of the session will be David Lee. <laughs> so it's from leading edge to backward look, I guess. <laughs> um, but no matter where we travel, there always seems to be history with an astronomical connection. Uh, in Newfoundland, those of us who attended the GA sailed the same waters as Edmund Halley. Uh, in the border city of Windsor, we considered the uh, migration of James Craig Watson from uh, his birthplace in uh, Fingo, Ontario, to the United States, where he became a world-renowned astronomer. And last year in Edmonton, uh, we recalled the practical astronomy carried out by Canada's great map makers and surveyors, David Thompson and Peter Fiddler. No one will be surprised that Kingston, too, has a, a strong astronomical history. Many people before me have studied and written on this, and of course I'm deeply indebted to them. In our program, uh, the great little book with the blue cover that I keep referring to, uh, to find out where we're supposed to be, there are two excellent write-ups. Uh, one uh, by Bernie Zimkowitz explaining his display in Sterling Hall, which I hope everyone has looked at, and the other by Leo about the history of the Kingston Center. Um, because of the strategic location of uh, Kingston at the entrance to, the, uh, to Lake Ontario from the St. Lawrence River, uh, it's always been considered of vital importance. Uh, during the French regime in 1742, and it was still Cataraqui, its latitude was found to second of arc precision by Father Joseph Bonacom on his travels to the Ohio River Valley from Quebec. Latitude and longitude were the reason for much of the astronomy that was carried out in the 19th century. And after Bonacom, uh, James Williamson made the earliest observations in Kingston, of which I am aware. And that starts the slides here. Um, OK, do you turn them on initially, or? <coughs> Yeah, there's a focusing on here. Sorry, the, there's forward and backward. Okay, there we go. Thanks. So that's Williamson. Um, maybe I'll put this little lamp on so I can still see. Okay, well, I'll try my best to. Uh, remember what I want to say about all these people. Uh, um, so Williamson uh, was appointed to uh, the faculty of Queens right from the very start, 1842, when the university was just a, a one, one very small house. Um, and uh, so that's a help. Uh, he. Uh, so he emigrated from Scotland, um, and shortly after, incidentally, he married John A. Macdonald's sister. Williamson timed the contacts of partial phases of social solar eclipses in uh, 1845 and 1846, and of the transit of Mercury in 1845. Uh, this is a diagram that Newcomb prepared showing all the transits of Mercury from 1600 to 2100. These are the May transits, and there's a similar diagram which I won't show for the November transit. So it wasn't a central transit, but it was uh, uh, quite a, a long one, and several hours. Uh, <coughs> He uh, also used lunar distances and phenomena of Jupiter satellites with less accuracy, but he used all these things to determine the longitude of Kingston. The annular eclipse of May the 26th, 1854, was even more exciting and important. Uh, you can see the path of annularity went 
right along the Canadian border, and Kingston was just inside the uh, line of the path of annularity. Uh, 12,000 citizens were quite as excited then as people would be now by such a phenomenon. The contacts were, of course, carefully timed, not only by Williamson, but also at the Murney Tower, which I hope you've seen just south of here, uh, by Baron de Rottenberg, a quartermaster with the British Army, using a six centimeter Dolan refractor, and Fred J. Rowan, who used a small instrument made by the famous firm of uh, President Sims. But equally interesting, the eclipse stimulated the desire for a public observatory. Just as we talk now about Comet Hale Bot uh, being used as a vehicle to stimulate public interest in astronomy, the people back then, in, uh, in 1854, uh, used uh, the annular eclipse. And um, not only that eclipse, but uh, the interest was stimulated probably by Williamson himself, who introduced astronomy into the curriculum at Queen's, and the appearance of a book published in Kingston and written by the Reverend Dia Hutchinson. Oops, wait, sorry. Uh, there's a little picture of the Murney Tower. But here's the title page of Hutchinson's book. Thanks. Um, Three <laughs> um, uh, at the bottom, you see the date of publication is uh, 1855. And that's uh, kind of interesting to think that in a town of 12,000, uh, somebody would be able to uh, publish a, a book on astronomy. Anyway, because of the interest in the eclipse and these books and Williamson's courses, an observatory committee was established in April 1855. Lieutenant E. D. Ash of the Royal Navy came from Quebec to give a public lecture in December of that year. And in 1856, a small frame observatory opened in the city park just east of here. Uh, I have looked for. Uh, a historical background, don't worry, uh, um, there, a historical plaque marking the site of the observatory uh, was uh, erected in uh, 1985, and I have tried in vain to find the plaque in my visit here. I found a post which appears to be a place where the plaque should be, but somebody must think astronomical history in Kingston is very important. And, removed it, I believe. <laughs> so there's a project for somebody in the Kingston Center to try to find out what happened and get it reinstalled. Uh, the, um, the observatory's main in instrument, purchased at a cost of uh, $800, was a 16 centimeter Alvin Clark refractor, which was part of the display in Stern Hall. And uh, in this slide, which Bernie's input kindly lent me, it's an excellent uh, uh, slide showing the telescope. 1856 was the year that the rail line connecting Toronto and Montreal opened, and Kingston was then linked telegraphically to these and other centers, resulting in an improved longitude correct within a kilometer. The astronomical highlight of 1858 was Donati's Comet. Uh, there were several articles in the newspaper, then called the Daily British Week, and the public flocked to the little observatory. Apparently, there had to uh, there had to be compromises even then between the public wanting to take a gander through the telescope and those wanting to make serious scientific observations. Uh, Williamson did succeed in making uh, several positional observations of Donati's Comet. And uh, this is a report in the Canadian Journal, which I've 
just highlighted a few things. He included an observation a day later than the last on which a similar one was obtained in Britain. It may have been uh, the last one before the comet got too close to the sun to be observed. He says the nucleus was as bright as a star of the first magnitude at a tail of about 32 degrees. And of course, the observations were made with the Albert Clark telescope. Uh, and uh, oh. uh, it's kind of fun, of course, to use modern software, like I have the Dance of the Planets, just to see where the, tele where the comet was at the time. And I don't know how well you can see this, but uh, these lines, the blue lines in the corner are the horizon lines uh, at the time of the observation by Williamson. And indeed, the comet was pretty close to the horizon. And the sun had, was just, uh, twilight was just ending. Um, Okay, uh, astronomy and, and Queen's got a couple of boosts in the next few years. In 1860, the observatory got its first annual grant of $500 from the government on condition that a qualified observer could be found and the public lectures would be given. This inevitably led to the transfer of the control of the observatory to the university. Williamson, of course, was the qualified observer and lecturer. And in 1861, the frame structure was replaced with a more substantial brick building, comprising a central dome, a transit room, and a room for observers and the public. And this is the only uh, illustration, apparently, which survives of the observatory. It's just east of here, uh, near the corner of Barry and Baggett Streets. You can see it up there, just to the upper left of the uh, picture, the center of the picture. Um, uh, the recently appointed principal at Queen's, formerly assistant to physicist Nickel of Edinburgh, you know, of Nickel Prisons, uh, the, his assistant William Leach came over as principal of Queen's and he presented a reflecting telescope equipped with a 19 centimeter speculum mirror made by Short to the observatory. The same year, in 1861, Leach wrote three popular articles on astronomy. Uh, here is a portrait of William Leach. Um, in these properly popular articles, he described a his visit to Cambridge, Massachusetts, where he visited with G.P. Bond, director of the Harvard College Observatory. Bond was just starting to use uh, chron uh, sorry, uh, chronograph, uh, or <laughs> chronograph, like the one you saw in the display in Stirling Hall, an instrument which enabled times and transits of stars across the meridian to be much more accurately determined. Uh, Leach also visited the firm of Alvin Clark, and at the time, in 1861, Clark was just completing the uh, large lens, uh, whatever size it was. I, I think it was 18 inches, but I had it written down here. Uh, 46 centimeters, the 46 centimeter lens, which was uh, uh, eventually, well, just in fact, just a matter of months later, Clark used to detect the companion to Sirius. Uh, so these visits of Leach to Cambridge were described in the articles, but they were also described in uh, the book. There's the, the chronograph which you saw on the display. It's probably similar to the one used by Paul. Here's the title page of Leach's book, God's Glory in Heaven, 1862. Um, well, in 1863, a young astronomically minded undergraduate named Nathan Dupuy was appointed observer of the uh, observatory. Much of his work involved timing of transits and stars as they crossed the meridian. Uh, at first, he used a small instrument by Troughton and Sims. Again, in the display, 
Um, and uh, in fact, the receipt for from the firm is still in the archives of the university. Uh, next year, he, his uh, work was aided by a larger and uh, better instrument called the Beaufoy, Beaufoy instrument, transit instrument, was lent by the Royal Astronomical Society of London. Um, although I always am hesitant to use the word first, I think uh, it, there's some justification for saying that Nathan Dupuy was the first Canadian-born and Canadian-employed professional astronomer. Uh, at, at this delightful little book is available, I think, still uh, on his life and work. Um, he had quite a talent, of course, as you've seen from the display uh, for mechanical things and uh, made some outstanding clocks. Uh, the portrait of Dupuis on the left and the picture of Grand Hall just across the street where uh, Dupuis home, uh, he built the clock and the mechanism and it was the one in the tower there for uh, from about 1803 until quite recently. Um, he also was quite a talented artist, and a couple of his paintings are shown in this book, and of course, Dupuy Hall is named for him. Um, in 1881, as a result of vandalism, the observatory was moved from the city park onto the campus, and uh, thanks to uh, Stuart Redfrew at the Queen's Archives. I have the slides. This large building in the foreground, you've probably seen if you walk around the campus, certainly Queen's people would know it. It's the old arts building that now houses uh, the Department of Theology, I believe. And further back to the left is a smaller building called Carruthers Hall, the science building. And then just beside that is the uh, site of the observatory from 1881 on. And from that site, the transit of Venus was observed in 1882. Uh, here's a closer up picture of uh, Carruthers Hall and the observatory. Uh, well, uh, it didn't stay there too long. Uh, I think it was uh, in 1909. Uh, it moved again to the southwest corner of Stewart Street and University Avenue, and that was what it looked like then. And uh, there it stayed until 1946, where it was demolished, and uh, the uh, uh, Alvin Clark telescope ceased to be used. Well, just before I finish, I just want, don't want to leave the impression that it was only at Queens that uh, astronomy was flourishing in the 19th century. Um, moving to the east, there was a, a small observatory at RMC, the Royal Military College, erected in the, um, uh, about 1890 uh, for the use of students studying surveying. And uh, uh, we should also remind ourselves that David Thompson uh, surveyed uh, much of the St. Lawrence River uh, earlier in the century, in 1820. There are even two islands in the, in, in the uh, St. Lawrence called Trenton and Sims. I don't know if you can see the Lake Fleet Islands. Just below the word lake is Trenton Island. And to its left, Ramsden Island, another extreme figure. Uh, in Brockville, there was an outstanding amateur, Edmund Sinclair. And I guess I have no time to tell you about his comet observations. <laughs> uh, he did observe comets in 1853 and 4, and you can see where they are on the desk. <laughs> Peter's look, looking back at the history of the Royal Astronomical Society. <laughs> looking up. Yes. Uh, I'm sure most of us have it. It's a superb, superb book. We have congratulations, Peter.